All right, welcome everybody to today's TUM AI lecture. Um, it's a real pleasure today to have Judy Hoffman with us. Um, she's a professor at Georgia Tech. Um, she's uh, doing research on cutting edge vision, ML, domain adaptation, robustness, and fairness. Um, she received her PhD from UC Berkeley, and afterwards she became a postdoc um, at both Stanford and Berkeley. She also was a visiting research scientist before joining Georgia Tech at FAIR. Um, and of course, many of you have known her, work, uh, her works. Um, she has received countless of awards. She's a pioneer and a rock star in domain adaptation. She had very, very popular methods such as Sukara, Ada, and it's a real pleasure to have you here today with us. And we're really interested in what you're going to talk about in terms of understanding and mitigating bias in visual recognition. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this is one of the amazing things about uh, the times right now is because everybody's online, it presents opportunities like this to speak across the globe, um, which is just awesome. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. And I wanna talk to you today about um, some things that I've been thinking about for a long time uh, that have to do with how we measure performance of our models and how we might be able to use that measurement in order to understand and potentially mitigate some of the biases that exist in our data sets and in our models themselves. So today's talk is gonna be focused on visual recognition and um, mainly focused on tasks like classification and detection or instance segmentation. So we can think about a motivating example here of let's say we are a car driving around in the world and we, we see a photo um, taken from maybe our dash cam that looks like something on the right. And we'd like to be able to understand aspects of the scene, like where the pedestrians are, where the other cars are, where the road is. The types of information that we need in order to make safe, reliable decisions about what to do next. Okay, so this is, this is one such problem that people want to be able to solve. Um, and standard pipelines for solving these types of recognition problems look something like this. Well, we first go out and collect a large data set. We usually ask people to provide annotations which specify the desired outputs of our system. So maybe in classification, we wanna be able to say, these are dogs. And then, we train some end-to-end -end deep model that can take as input some of the data from this, this training data set, this collection of data that we have, and be able to reproduce these human annotations. And because this procedure is so common and um, so viable, especially with these big deep models, there have been lots and lots of benchmark tasks that have been set up. So in classification, we have these large benchmarks like ImageNet and Places, uh, which have tons of images, lots of different categories, enable us to really study this problem in a consistent way across labs, across researchers. And then in detection, we have these other data sets like Pascal, Coco, Cityscapes, Elvis, and many, many more. So this procedure that we have of collecting these big data sets is very, very prevalent. And there's great reason why. Uh, we found that learning from these large data sets can really dramatically improve the type of performance that we get from these models. And that brings us to this last phase in the pipeline, which is validation of our model. And frequently what we do here is we will do the standard machine learning pipeline. We will take our original training data set, we'll separate it into train, val, and test, and we'll report performance on this held out test set. But there are some details here that get a little bit lost in the shuffle, especially when we're talking about benchmark tasks and we need to have some sort of a leaderboard and compare against one another. And so today's talk is going to focus a lot on how do we actually do this evaluation and what are the details that get lost when we focus on one particular metric. So that's gonna be the first part, is trying to understand when we have a big complicated metric that summarizes our results, and we use that in order to compare against different approaches across different data sets, different architectures, different models. What are we actually learning there? And how much can we understand about behavior of models just from that number? The second part we're gonna think about is there's a pretty critical assumption that's made 
in the standard learning pipeline, which is that we're going to assume our test data is drawn from the same distribution as our training. And that's usually an implicit assumption just because you collect a big pool of data and you hold out a little bit of it in order to evaluate your model. And the last part is going to push the boundary of thinking about rather than just evaluation over all of the data set at once and summarizing that performance even just within a category or across across data from a particular uh, particular data set what happens if we start to think about the breakdown of the performance within a data set itself and potentially how that might have variable performance for, for different subsets of our data. So to get started, let's start, start thinking about how we analyze our performance. So for a task like detection, we have this, this complex task. We have images. We need to be able to recognize things in the images. And we need to be able to localize, either with bounding box or with masks. And this is a very, very popular task in the vision, especially visual recognition community. And what we do is we report this metric called mean average precision. And um, we use that. It's, it's great. It's like a summary metric that everybody can report. We can have giant tables that compare this number across lots and lots of different methods. People can upload it to the, the leaderboard. You can kind of keep track of what's the what's the latest and greatest model um, for this task on this data set. But this metric itself is quite complex. There's a lot of different aspects to it. This is just one slide taken from um, Coco that might evaluate the metric in various different ways, thinking about these minor hyperparameter decisions of how much overlap do you need between ground truth and, and uh, predicted regions before you consider it a true positive. There's just a lot of different decisions that are being made and even within one of those decisions, we already have a complicated metric that we're thinking about here with just average precision. We're computing a precision recall curve over all of our proposed predictions. We're sorting them based off of some score. Maybe we made some thresholding decision. We then compute this integral over the area under the curve of this precision recall. And then we do it for every category and we average the performance across all of these categories for this area under this curve with all of these hyperparameter decisions. And at the end of the day, we compute this mean AP number and use it to compare two models. Okay, so with just the summary number, we think, well, great. We know that model one gets 42 mean AP and model two gets 45 mean AP. So that should tell us that model two is better, right? That seems like a, a simple conclusion to draw here. But in practice, the decision is actually quite a bit more complicated. And if somebody is coming along with a new data set or wants to use these models out in the wild, it's not entirely clear which model is better. And in fact, focusing so much on just this summary statistic may even be misleading. Because what if I have these two models, but they have really different behaviors? So even though overall for mean AP, model one is lower, what if it's much better at recognizing categories of interest? So if I have this self-driving task, perhaps what I care most about is being able to detect that there is in fact a pedestrian in front of me, even if the localization is really coarse and fails at this overlap criteria. Whereas if the other model is overall much better at precise localization leading to a higher mean AP, but it suffers from mislabeling of the categories that we care about, that could be catastrophic. So overall, whenever we define some kind of a metric and especially something as complicated as mean AP, if we're not getting 100% performance, it's actually just as important to know where that missing performance went to as it is to know the mean AP number itself. And so what we did is we thought about what are ways in which we can create a compact summary of the types of ways in which you could have errors in this detection problem. And for that, we introduced this toolbox 
um, called Tide, uh, which is available online now. And the main goal of this work was to be able to stick with the idea of being able to directly compare across models. We want to have some sort of a compact summary of sources of error, but we want to be able to not only explain the performance of a model, but also the loss in performance. And it was really important to us that when we were designing this toolkit, we took into account exactly how this performance metric mean AP is computed and designed types of errors explicitly based off of how they might impact the model's uh, performance on this metric. It was also important to us that we could design a metric that was usable and reliable across data sets and across deployment regimes. We want it to be something that's, that's kind of a holistic summary that can be reused. And we also did not, as much as possible, did not want to have a lot of hyperparameters like thresholding or counting um, certain number of top detections. And so we designed this toolkit to be able to use all of the detections that were output by a model, of course, taking into account the scores and the rankings. And it's also important that it's not a static toolkit, even though this is one way to break down sources of error, kind of the meta point of this talk is to convince you that doing these types of systematic analysis across lots of different models is, is far more illuminating than just looking at the overall performance metric. So this problem has actually been looked at though not that extensively before. One of the most commonly cited works is this work from Derek Hoim et al. And uh, this, this work was designed explicitly on the Pascal benchmark. It, it had some sort of innate uh, category similarity measures that were designed for that data set. And um, it's, as a result, not necessarily been quite as used in um, later data sets that have come. What's more commonly used today is the COCO Evaluation Toolkit, which produces analysis uh, results that look something like this. Now, one of the biggest differences between both of these two works and what we do here, it has to do with how you compute uh, errors, and in particular, how you compute the contribution of an error to your overall model's performance. So this work from 2012, what they did was they just took a very intuitive measure, which said, well, I want to count up how many errors I have out of my top end detections that um, could be reasonably attributed to each of these error types that I'm designing. Uh, one of the problems there, of course, is the fact that you have to choose n. Um, and the other problem is that counting up types of errors actually does not tell you what's the contribution to the overall mean AP metric. Because of course, if you were to fix one type of error, it implicitly might actually fix another type of error as a result, especially because of how mean AP does this sort of sorting and reordering of detections. This other work, the COCO Evaluation Toolkit, um, it has some deficiencies in that it can be a little bit difficult to interpret. Uh, and I'm gonna give you an example of why that's the case. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to kind of look at the areas here that are taken up by each of these error types and uh, use that as some sort of cue of the relative um, importance. Um, but there's not necessarily a, a tight number associated with each error type. It's more of a, um, it's more of this area under this PR curve. And more importantly, there's a little bit of a difficulty in terms of how these types of errors are computed. So you get out a result that looks something like this, where this first line, this black line tells you what was your performance of your original model. And the way that we start computing the contribution of each type of error is that we basically consider fixing that type of error. So for class, we fix the class error. And now we get a new PR curve. And um, then when we fix both class and localization error, we get yet another PR curve. And the idea is that you're supposed to sort of look at this area. So this highlighted region now, it's gonna presumably tell me something about the contribution of localization error to this overall model. 
And you kind of do this for all the different error types. So based off of this plot here, we would reasonably assume that this background error looks like it's one of the main contributors to loss in performance for this model. But if we instead consider computing error types and, and contribution of error types in a different order. So here we did it very explicitly. We first did class and then we fixed localization and then both and then duplicate. If we instead just swapped the order of background and class type errors and computed background first, you'll notice that the output um, analysis of contribution of error has changed pretty substantially, namely that background error that we thought was really important before now looks not quite as important. And class error that didn't look like a huge contributing factor has now grown. So what, what's going on here? Uh, why are we getting this type of result? This again has to do with the fact that we're using this um, average precision metric, uh, which considers implicitly this ordering um, over all of our different detections when it's it's being computed and as a result of that actually the order in which you fix an error can impact the relative um the relative impact on your pr curve when computed in this kind of sequential error fixing way so we'd like to avoid this because what we really really want is to be able to take some models and understand what's the contribution of different types of errors? And when we say that, what we mean is we'd like to be able to know if you were to fix this error. So if you were to work really hard and design a new um, change to your model that's targeting localization error, how much performance improvement can I expect in mean AP? And similarly, if I just wanna take a model and deploy it in the world, what I'd love to know is what sort of behavior I can expect from this model. So I can make an informed decision about which model might be better suited for my current, um, my current application. So that's what we're going to try to do here is we're going to think about these overall goals, think about a way in which that we can design error types to be able to produce a consistent analysis across data sets, across models, that is not susceptible to reordering, that does not have hyperparameters that only choose the top end detections, and that accurately reflects expected performance improvement, or in other way of saying it is performance that's lost um, by this model due to a particular type of error. So this is what we do. We are going to define six different types of errors. The first one is going to be a pretty standard one that is very natural to think of, which is just classification error. And this really means that you have good overlap with ground truth, um, but you're just mislabeling the category. The second one is localization error, which means that you are predicting the correct category, but you don't have quite enough overlap with the corresponding ground truth. We then have both, which is missing both overlap with the ground truth as well as mislabeling. Duplicate error, this is an artifact of the way in which that we design detection systems and evaluate them that um, having duplicates will in fact impact your uh, average precision error. Background error, which just means making a prediction when nothing is there. And finally, miss error, which means that you make a, uh, um, uh, or, sorry, background error is when you um, are not making, a, or when you're making a prediction, nothing is there. And then we have, my slides seem to be slightly out of sync. And then miss error, where there's a ground truth that exists, but you miss it entirely. So it's a pretty, like, when presented like this, they seem like pretty straightforward errors. Uh, they make sense for what we're solving with the detection task. But critically, when you design it in this way, we can do very simple uh, computations to derive how much performance is lost due to a particular type of error. So we can consider fixing just that type of error 
computing the mean average precision and doing uh, the difference between that improved model and the original model in order to compute the contribution of that error type. And there's no issues with reordering here because each of these errors can be computed independently and they've been designed in such a way to encompass all types of errors of the model. So if you were to fix each of these six error types, you would get up to 100 mean AP. So as a result, what we can do is we can directly measure the performance loss for this metric of mean AP and summarize it both as this pie chart here that tells you the relative contribution of each type of error in your model, as well as in this absolute bar chart that tells you the direct amount of lost mean AP performance due to which error, each error type. And I mentioned before that this is extensible, meaning that this sort of philosophy of um, defining these types of, defining error types in terms of the way in which they can break down all sources of lost performance for the mean AP metric. That can be done in different ways. For example, here, there is a breakdown in terms of false positives and false negatives. OK, so now into some of the analysis of this. Well, once we have this model, we can now really start to compare the performance of, of, of different models out there. So here's six different models that we downloaded and, and we're able to run the toolkit on. So now instead of just having this uh, average precision or mean average precision to compare, what you can do is you can actually compare more detailed analysis of the behavior of these models. Let's just quickly look at one point of comparison here. We have RetinaNet and YOLAC++. YOLAC++ is actually a pretty similar model to RetinaNet, but it was stripped down a bit in order to um, make it faster, more real time. And so what we can see is that the loss in performance here is actually due to um, higher localization and, and miss errors. So this tells us something about the trade-off that you're making. In order to get this additional speed, you, you actually increase some of these um, false negative type errors. Now, it doesn't always illuminate um, some of these comparison points so explicitly. And so one other way um, that you might consider doing this analysis is by breaking down along other axes of, of, of comparison. So for example, with HTC and TridentNet, these two models appear the same in terms of the breakdown of error types. But if you instead looked at the contribution to localization error for HTC and TridentNet, um, you would be able to find that they impact um, different size boxes in different ways. And by having this sort of analysis or any other points of comparison that you might have for your particular application, um, you, you can immediately start to understand if you are designing a model, making a change to a model in order to enact a, a particular or fix a particular sort of issue that you see existing in um, the current literature, well, now you can just directly measure it and justify the choice of your particular change. So here's another interesting part of comparison, which is that um, you can look at a particular model's performance across data sets. So rather than just knowing, well, on Coco, I get um, you know, this one mean AP, and on Elvis, I get a much lower mean AP, it might be interesting to understand why and what exactly is the, the difference in the performance of the model across different data sets. So for this Coco Elvis scenario, um, Elvis has a lot more categories. It's actually the same images, but just a lot more categories labeled. And as you can see, a lot of the performance loss actually has more to do with um, mislabeling the categories. And so if you wanted to fix your performance on Elvis, perhaps it's not actually the detector that needs a lot of fixing, but rather this underlying classification backbone and how it can heal with, deal with kind of fine grain recognition, long tail problems. And you can, of course, use this type of analysis now to justify changes to models like Frequently, what people will do in a paper is they'll try to make an effort to have some sort of an ablation study. They'll say that um, we, we want to be able 
um, we want to be able to make a change. We, we notice there this, this issue, confidence doesn't match localization quality. So we wanna be able to maybe implement some module that will try to solve some of these issues with um, localizations by maybe doing some sort of rescoring. Um, and then at the end of the day, you see that you got some minor mean AP improvement point, point two in this case, and you claim a win. You say, great, I fixed I fixed this thing and my model improved a little bit. And so I must have uh, improved the thing that I actually claim to be fixing. So here, what we're arguing for is that we should just directly measure these things that we're trying to fix. In this case, if it was localization, you wanna be able to see that actually my localization error went down, which it did. But of course, as a result, some other error types went up and it's still kind of important to be able to understand these things. So overall, this toolkit and more broadly, just more work in this type of design of careful uh, re and reusable analysis of where our models are failing, um, I think is highly valuable and um, needs to be studied more if we're going to be able to, to realistically start to deploy these things, um, have them used across wider varieties of applications and data. This particular toolkit is available um, for use now. It's kind of a drop-in replacement for the COCO eval. It takes in the same types of JSON result files as are used for um, that benchmark platform. And it, it's available here if you're interested. Okay, so that was a long, a long discussion. And I, I kind of went into a lot of detail about metrics because I wanted to belabor the point and really make it very clear that when we, we focus in on these really complicated metrics, um, there's a lot of details that are lost in the shuffle. And a lot of, um, a lot of these details actually make huge impact on the behavior of the models that we produce and shouldn't be ignored. And, should especially be considered when it addresses a particular type of problem that you are, are clearly targeting, that you, you really want to fix. Um, there should be ways to design these types of analysis that can, can really just directly measure everything that's going on. Um, and we shouldn't focus solely on the overall performance, but rather also on um, quantitative ways to understand and summarize uh, the types of ways in which our models are, are still subpar. Okay, so the, the next thing I wanna discuss about evaluation is something that I've looked at for quite a while, uh, especially as it relates to domain adaptation, which is that um, when we are evaluating a model, we implicitly uh, assume something about the test data. And actually this choice of test data is really quite, quite critical. Um, and you know, frequently when we have benchmarks, um, what we do is we have train and test data drawn from the same distribution, meaning taken from the same data set. So here's, here's a plot of performance on this ImageNet benchmark um, for classification. And uh, if you, were to just look at this plot, it would be really natural to say, well, hey, this, this last model here is, is working so well. Um, isn't that just great? Aren't we just done? And um, you know, this is a classification problem. So does that mean that we've basically solved classification? And the fact that we have these kind of plots of performance improving over time on these, these closed um, benchmarks has actually um, just perpetuated this narrative that if you have enough data and you have um, a high enough capacity model, you're just, you're kind of done. You have, you have a recipe for success um, and we can all move on to some other problem. But again, this sort of um, particular choice of, of how we evaluate our models um, is, is sweeping some, some pretty big issues under the rug. And in general, this ImageNet data set, it has lots and lots of categories in it, but we take that model and um, even though it looks like it's working so well and we try to evaluate it on some new 
held out source of data, maybe this video of the dog running, and we find that it can just fail miserably. And this is perhaps unsurprising to people that work in this particular area, but it happens as a result of this thing called data set bias, which is that even though it sounds like millions of images is a lot, a lot of images to train on. And even though we have lots of categories and one of them that we're doing so well on is dog, um, the types of diversity in terms of uh, what's represented in the images as well as um, how they were captured or curated um, is really not representative of everything that we will in fact see in the world. So in particular, um, ImageNet was collected by scraping these different social media sharing sites. Flickr was one of the big ones. And, you know, Flickr is going to be a site where people come to show off uh, their photos, maybe share them with friends and family, or if you're a photographer, maybe share them with your, your broader community. Um, and so as a result, there is actually an implicit curation bias in terms of what type of data people choose to share with each other. And um, this bias can have a, a big impact on the types of information that our models learn to extract. And these images of dogs are all going to have um, things like center bias. They're going to have a potentially higher resolution. Um, they're going to be um, quite frequently showing images of uh, the dog's face. Um, this is really common when we're talking about animals and people. So instead, when we're looking at still frames of the video, what we find is that you have um, potentially lower resolution just due to the medium, things like motion blur, and have to recognize objects in a wider variety of poses than you might have seen in your original training data set. And people have tried to address this problem by um, designing techniques for what's called domain adaptation, where you assume that you train on one set of data, which is called the source domain or source distribution. This could be data like the ImageNet data set that was kind of curated and manually annotated. It could be things like a collection of um, images taken from a product warehouse or it could be simulated imagery. Just in general, it's gonna be a set of data that you have access to lots of labels on. And then the key idea here is that we wanna analyze the performance of our model when the test distribution changes a bit. And it could be that the test distribution changed because you're moving from ImageNet to this video domain or it could be that you would like to recognize those same products as they appear in an office environment. Or you wanna take your simulated model and use it to recognize in the real world. In any of these cases, what we find is that performance doesn't always work out of the box. In fact, it frequently doesn't. And so what people try to do is they try to design techniques um, to be able to adapt a model that was trained in the scenario where lots of labels were present and then be able to um, really learn from the data itself with a lot of human intervention to adapt this model for use in this new target domain. And this is quite frequently studied um, by looking at this problem of distribution alignment. People will design all kinds of different alignment metrics and turn them into loss functions and use them in order to update underlying deep representations um, to be able to um, do things like make sure that the, the source and the target representations are indistinguishable after, after you've passed them through the model so that a classifier trained on the source is more likely to um, be able to recognize things from the target. Wait, but this type of alignment technique and this type of study is in itself making some set of assumptions of our target data or of our test data. So while it's assuming that the source and target aren't necessarily captured in the same way, aren't necessarily of the same distribution, it is sort of implicitly assuming that they at least have the same amount of each category represented. So for example, if 
50% of the source data set was bottles, you're sort of making an implicit assumption that 50% of the target data set is also going to be bottles. And this isn't always true. Frequently, what we have access to is maybe our source data set has been curated in some way um, because it has access to manual annotations. And maybe it's curated to be balanced or to have at least something close to a balanced distribution across categories of interest. But our target data set, it might not be. In particular, if it's unlabeled, it might be drawn from a power law distribution, which is quite common for, for naturally occurring objects. And in that case, we're faced with this issue where our, our source and our target distributions over label space are not necessarily the same. And so we'd like to be able to still perform some set of adaptation, even when this setting arises. We'd like to be able to take a model that was trained even under a different label distribution and adapt it for this new target domain. And fortunately, there's been a class of techniques that have gained a lot of popularity both in the adaptation community as well as in self-supervised learning communities um, to do what's called self-training. The two most common types of self-training are um, computing pseudo-labels and just using a, a standard supervised loss, assuming those pseudo-labels are your true labels and um, doing things like entropy minimization on your output distributions. The nice thing about these styles of approaches is that they don't really make many assumptions about the similarity of source and target label distributions. And some recent methods that, that use these types of approaches are currently performing very well on a lot of our standard um, domain adaptation benchmarks, as well as across these sort of benchmarks that look explicitly at um, trying to handle label distribution shift. But these sort of self-training methods come with some inherent risk. And I'm gonna show you an example of one type of um, risk that, that can arise. So imagine I have uh, a distribution space here. I have um, two categories I'm trying to recognize, these circles and triangles. And I have um, my source model that I've, I've trained with lots of labels. And so I can place my, um, all of my, my source data, these red, circles and triangles at some point in high dimensional space such that they can be well classified. I can you know, build a, a class boundary that can tell me everything on one side are my circles and the other side are my triangles. But under a domain shift, uh, some of the target categories may end up being misaligned. So it might look something like this, where these blue unlabeled target points, um, you know, some of the circles fall near the circles, but some of, of the uh, circles also fall near the triangles and vice versa. And so when you take a self-training type of approach, maybe something like entropy minimization, where we're just basically asking to increase the model's confidence on the currently predicted label, what we're doing is we're potentially reinforcing some errors that exist in this poor initialization and may lead to a clustering that looks something like this, where we are now pulling um, the examples closer to um, closer to the, the centers of, of, of the source models. And so one thing that uh, we've been working on is trying to understand what are ways in which we can make these types of self-training procedures more reliable, more robust. And in this one work called Sentry, um, what we do is we just think about uh, this key idea of what if we could find a way to reliably find the instances that we think um, are currently correctly labeled. And we're gonna do that by using um, predictive consistency. Some people have, um, have looked at this before uh, using things like model confidence and that suffers from its own issues in domain annotation I don't have time to go into. And the general idea is that we'd like to be able to increase a model's confidence on the instances that we think are reliable and decrease its confidence on the instances that we think are unreliable. And once we do that, we hope we'll end up with a situation like this where we've now aligned our, our, our data points closer to the correct source labels. <laughs> 
So here's how the model works. We start uh, by taking our source data. And just in case it's not already balanced, we can do some sort of class balancing to make sure that we're, we're learning kind of a, a, good, a good model for all classes of interest, pass it through our model, train it with a supervised loss, all very standard. Now, when we get access to some unlabeled target data points, um, we can pass it through the same model and get out some sort of a prediction. And um, because our, our target data set, we're not making any assumptions about the distribution of the labels, what we're going to do is we're just going to keep track of all the labels, the pseudo labels as they come, and we're going to use them at, at every time we sweep through the data to help us to rebalance um, how, how we're going to, to sample our data for training. But now comes to the the key part of the method, which is just that we want some way to decide what do we do with this output prediction? How can we use it to actually enhance our training? And the idea that we have here is, is very similar and related to a lot of other um, literature in this space, which is that we want to think about augmentations um, to the image that we assume will be label preserving. Um, and we're going to use a set of these sort of augmentations, pass our images through the model, and be able to get out um, some alternative predictions for this image. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use our selective entropy loss that takes as input all of these different predictions across augmentations. And from these different predictions, what it does is it first checks for consistency. And this can be simple things like looking for majority vote on pseudo labels, um, or it could be something more complicated that analyzes the, the pseudo labels or the label, the output predictive distribution um, for similarities. But at the end of the day, you make a decision and you say that if, according to your consistency checker, you think this is consistent, then what we want to do is we want to choose to maximize the confidence of the model. And to do that, we minimize entropy. And if we think that a sample is inconsistent, then we want to do the opposite. We want to maximize entropy, which has the impact of reducing the model's confidence. So this is a very simple overall idea and model. Really, what we're doing is we're leveraging the fact that these sort of self-training procedures can um, enable um, a mismatch between label distribution on source and target data or train and test data. Um, and at the same time, we are using different forms of consistency checking to be able to, to gain some additional information about what, what do we believe should be the reliability or the confidence of the model. And then we can, we can look at the performance of this type of a model, this selective entropy optimization on different standard benchmarks. So things like this mini image net, uh, or mini domain net rather data set. Um, and uh, this data set naturally already has a label shift between source and target um, domains. This wasn't necessarily created intentionally, it just already exists. And what we can do is we can look at performance. Um, in this case, we're going to be looking at accuracy um, on these, these test sets. And uh, if you don't do anything, your model that was trained on one domain and tested on the other, it gets around 66%. If you do standard distribution matching um, criteria, you, depending upon the method, can gain a little bit of improvement or just stay about the same as the source model. Again, these methods don't really know much about what to do in the scenario of label shift. So this method here actually explicitly tries to handle label shift, though is, is not doing very well on this data set. And these three methods try to handle both data set shift and label shift. So that's the scenario that we have here. We're trying to handle what happens when everything, everything is kind of changing. Um, and they do it in a few different ways. This one does um, some sort of a relaxed version of distribution matching. Um, this one does um, some variant of self-training on confident pseudo labels, where confidence here is measured by um, the actual score of the model. And um, this one does some sort of combination of entropy minimization, contrastive loss, and mix up. And then this is our, our model's performance here. Again, this is averaged across 12 shifts in this data set. So it's kind of 
a lot of, as I was talking about before, there's a lot of information that's summarized in a small set of numbers here. Um, but this is, this is the performance on this particular data set. We also looked at it on other um, more extreme versions of this label shift problem. So here's a, a data set called Office Home, which was resampled to have exactly opposite um, label shift scenarios for the source and target uh, data. So one of them, the, you know, the most common category in one data set is the least common in the other. And again, on this, on this setting, uh, we find that there is some performance to be gained here by explicitly modeling these, uh, these issues of um, whether or not we have source and target data that is balanced in the same way across classes. And overall, um, if you're interested, check out the paper. It has examples um, for a bunch of different data sets, a bunch of different shifts. Um, and this, this simple method of just being careful about when you apply these self-training optimization techniques performs quite well. In the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip these remaining ablations, um, which just look at things like making sure that the model is actually improving performance um, across all categories equally, um, and um, trying to understand things about when um, when this selection criteria is activated or inactivated and how accurate that process is. OK, so overall, I talked about two um, different things so far, but they're very related to this, the same core principle of how are we evaluating our models. The first one is really focusing on ways in which we can advance um, the state of the art in terms of how we analyze complicated performance metrics. And this, this latter one with Sentry is trying to understand um, what we can do to mitigate the problems when, when we are confronted with the fact that we have a test setting that is so different from our training setting, how can we recover um, when we have this, this big loss in performance? In the remaining 10 minutes of today, I want to touch on one last aspect of evaluation that is really often overlooked, which is that um, when we compute our performance metrics, whatever they may be, mean AP, accuracy, um, we can of course think about where do we pull our test set from. We can try to be careful to measure generalization performance on unseen test sets um, when assumptions break, like when we might have a different distribution over categories, maybe we can break down performance by categories and we can um, try to, to look at things in that way to try to gain some more um, concrete understanding of how well things work and when but we're still ignoring one detail, which is that if we focus solely on aggregate performance metrics, meaning that you have this entire collection of data and you look at your performance, your accuracy, your mean AP over all of it at once, we might be ignoring the negative impact that implicit data set or model bias can have on sub parts or subsets of our data. And sometimes those subsets of our data actually correspond with subpopulations in the world. So probably many of you remember this example from 2015 that looked at uh, a recognition uh, piece of software. And the software had a horrible mistake against people of darker skin tones. And this problem was studied more directly and more explicitly um, through this work called Gender Shades, uh, where what they did was they really just tried to create a benchmark data set that could even allow us to start to understand the enormity of this problem. Unfortunately, if we want to be able to measure how well our models perform across some factor uh, uh, that might vary in different populations like gender or like skin tone, then we have to first label that. And even before that, we have to collect the data. And so that's what they did here was they made sure to collect a data set that was balanced across these two different factors of skin type and gender and so that they could then start to measure how well did off the shelf models even perform across these different factors? And they found um, perhaps not 
not surprisingly now, because this is sort of a well-known result at this point, they found that the error rates, especially on darker skinned females, was substantially higher than on lighter skinned males. And this was for off-the-shelf models that were being deployed um, potentially to solve or make decisions that affect people's lives. So this is a huge issue. And it's completely brushed under the rug if all you look at is accuracy over the whole data set. Because a couple of things can happen here. Well, first, your data set may not be representative of all these populations. You may not even have the data to be able to analyze yet. And secondly, even if you have some examples within the data set, if they don't comprise a majority of your data set, then you don't even notice that uh, your performance has taken a hit as a result of that um, low performance on that subpopulation. So we started thinking about this problem and how it might impact other application areas that are seeing lots of interest. One of them is this self-driving setting where we have, you know, of course, hundreds of thousands of hours of driving um, around different cities, different times of day, different weather patterns. And we wanted to see whether or not this same issue of skin type bias existed in pedestrian detection. So here we took the same um, sort of skin type labeling procedure that was used in the gender shades work, which relies on this Fitzpatrick skin type labeling scale. Um, it was originally developed by dermatologists and it relates more to um, the likelihood of skin burning, um, but it gives us something to work with that we can give some sort of training procedure that we can give to um, labelers to be able to take a crop from the data set and um, automatically label for us whether or not um, this, this particular crop, this person um, has a different skin type. Um, and we separate it just for simplicity, similar to what gender shades did into darker skinned and lighter skinned individuals. And at the end of the day, um, we're able to uh, augment the annotations that exist within, in this case, this was the uh, BDD data set, but um, it could be done for any self-driving data set. We're able to augment these person annotations together with this skin type annotation. And first thing to comment on is that this is of course, a complicated problem. Sometimes pedestrians are way too small. Sometimes they're not turned towards the camera. So a lot of the examples of pedestrians just have to be thrown out because we can't we can't actually make any meaningful um, conclusions about um, skin type for those those samples. Um, and so we had to filter on uh, size of of the bounding box as well as um, annotator consensus. We took kind of three annotations and made sure that all of them consistently labeled um, or at least majority vote labeled it as either lighter skinned or darker skinned for it to be included in this benchmark. Once we did that though, first thing before you even measure performance of a model is just the surprising result that in this data set, there's a huge bias in terms of lighter skin and darker skin individuals, both in train and in validation set. And perhaps unsurprisingly then, the performance of off-the-shelf models um, degrades when you, you look at um, the pedestrian uh, recognition performance, the AP, for lighter skin and darker skin individuals. And again, the numbers here that we have to work with, the amount of data that we have, both for training and for validation is quite small. So if we wanna to start to understand why this is happening, we go back to that first section of the talk, like how can we analyze what's the loss in performance in these two scenarios? You know, some, some guesses of what it might be could be lack of training data. So we tried to mitigate this. We couldn't necessarily collect more data for this particular project, though I think that would be of huge value in general to the, the uh, computer vision community. Uh, so we tried standard techniques that are used to deal with label imbalance, like reweighting or rebalancing. We thought about whether or not there's confounding factors that exist in the data set that correspond with, with these two um, subpopulations. And so we tried to control for things like time of day or occlusion. None of those really yielded any difference in terms of performance. Um, there was still this gap between the two. And in my mind, this is still an ongoing open challenge problem that has seen a lot more steady in recent years. 
But one thing I want to make clear and comment on is the fact that even measuring this type of bias is extremely time consuming and costly. It's time consuming because it required um, thinking through and working with different people um, to decide and design sets of bias that you would like to measure. It's then costly on top of that because you need to annotate your data further beyond the categories of interest with these bias criteria. And you also need to potentially collect more data. And it becomes unclear at the end of the day if the result that the model is underperforming on certain subpopulations is inherent to the models that we've designed or is the result of the data that we use to train the model with. And unfortunately, if we don't start collecting more data across different subpopulations now, we can't even make any real reliable statistically significant claims, even if we start to validate across these axes. So there's some open research questions here which have to do with how could we possibly mitigate um, this situation uh, when we have so few examples. And it doesn't exactly match that domain adaptation scenario I was talking about before, though many of the current works in this space do leverage some of the adversarial learning type techniques uh, that we, we use as well in adaptation. And that, that's just because in adaptation community, we frequently don't study the problem when you have a lot um, or where you have very few examples in the target domain. We assume you might have very few labels or even no labels, but you have a lot of data to learn from. So if we don't even have the data yet, what can we do? Where can we go from here? And so these are really important questions that we need to continue to think about as a community. Um, and <clears throat> in order to solve them, we're, we're going to have to come up with different ways of, of measuring the performance of our model and thinking about performance evaluation overall. So that was kind of the point of this talk is to convince you that we need a lot more thought and care focusing on this validation step. I talked about kind of three different ways in which we're currently, um, we, we currently could use some more improvement uh, in terms of evaluation. In terms of metrics, the problem that I addressed was this issue where we over summarize um, our results, focus on performance, simplifying to one number so we can create these big benchmark tables. And some approaches that people could think about in this space or that we've looked at had to do with um, design, a, a careful design of potential types of errors for different different applications and, and using that inside of a visualization toolkit to be able to perform these types of model to model or data set to data set comparisons. For test data, the problem here is just making sure that when we are making claims about the performance of a model, we, we really contextualize that and think about the assumptions that are being made in terms of our test data both in terms of um, uh, you know, whether or not it's, the data is assumed to be very similar, so we can only make claims about performance under these certain conditions, or whether or not um, we're, we're sure about how it will perform as the, the quantity of particular categories changes. And there are some solutions in this space that others have looked at and ourselves in order to design um, some sort of adaptive techniques to incorporate new data on the fly. And finally, in focusing um, too much on aggregate performance metrics, we may inadvertently marginalize some subpopulations. And this here, in my mind, is a big open challenge that I think um, is starting to see a lot more um, work in this space and it'll be really exciting um, to hopefully make progress in this over the coming years. I wanna take a moment to thank all of the members of my research lab. Um, many of them were kind of highlighted on different slides when I talked about this project, but there are other members who are involved in this work as well. And um, I will leave this slide up here, which just kind of addresses some of the big broad questions that I think about in my research and in my lab. Um, I didn't have time to talk about adversarial robustness today, but in my mind, that's a concept that's very related to the things I talked about here. Um, and I will take any questions you all might have. Cool, yeah, thanks a lot. Really amazing work. Um, are there any questions on Zoom? Or maybe I can start with a few questions. Um, so, I mean, 
from a pure machine learning perspective, right? Like, I think one of the biggest problems is that if you're looking at these existing evaluations and like image classification and stuff like that, they kind of they kind of pretend that oh, this stuff is perfectly working, right? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I remember like a few years ago, people said, oh, like neural networks surpass human accuracy. And oh, now everything is working You're great. And oh, the benchmarks are getting better and better. And I, I really like about your work that you're actually showing that's not the case, right? So obviously it's very difficult. Like you're changing, changing out the data set, the test set, transfer is still difficult and so on. So, and when you're talking about these biases also in terms of like facial recognition and so on, is it something that, I mean, I don't know, like I would say this is obvious why it doesn't work. Is that like also a question of convincing people that it's, it, it's an issue or is it more like a, and it's still an algorithmic question in terms of, well, okay, so what are the things we have to address? Um, it's a little bit both. I think there is some convincing that needs to be done, or perhaps what my argument is, is that the convincing is to not ignore this, um, that we shouldn't be just reporting accuracy uh, in the case of classification. There should be some attempt at analysis and maybe even some structured attempt that's consistent across the community um, that, that looks at breakdown across you know, subsets of the data. Now, what that might mean in the case of, of subpopulation bias is different than in just pure um, algorithmic bias, like in the earlier part of the talk, where there's just different modes of operation of the model. And a lot of that can be obscured and might actually be quite important. Obviously, if you get 100%, um, then there's no errors to analyze. But then you're probably only getting 100% because you're looking at a really, really um, controlled setting of data. And so then we need to make sure to push ourselves and think about, well, what future types of data will it still continue to fail on? Um, and so that's, that's kind of the meta message here. Okay, um, so when you're talking about domain adaptation, what do you think is technically the right approach? Is it more like, well, we are just gonna use, I mean, you've done a lot of the stuff like use generative models in order to simulate kind of a target distribution or is it more like something, oh, you take two distributions and trying to find out how to align the modes? Yeah, they're, um, they're really similar, actually, those two styles of approaches. Um, it's just a matter of, are you, um, are you aligning in pixel versus um, in some latent space? And yeah. there's value in both of them. The, the value in pixel space alignment um, is that it gives us some type of interpretability. Uh, we can kind of probe an intermediate output of the system and, and think about, okay, well, I can sort of see that it fixed something to do with lighting or um, uh, uh, something, something to do with like the shapes of these particular types of categories have changed a little bit, look a little bit more like this other data set. Um, I'm a little bit weary of focusing too heavily on image space adaptation just because, because we are people so good at looking at images and interpreting them. Um, we're there. I've seen a lot of <laughs> error cases there where information is hidden in kind of low magnitude um, pixel values, um, which can, can dramatically impact like the information that's then further extracted for later parts of the pipeline. Um, and so I think that uh, I, I'm sort of cautious when it comes to that and I tend to prefer to work in, in feature space, but there's issues with feature space too and interpretability is one of the biggest ones. I see, makes sense. I mean, I would have argued that feature space at least to some degree could be lower dimensional. Like if you, right, right, you don't have to get every pixel right in, in whatever you're kind of simulating and what are your generative model or so is doing. So I thought it was easier and maybe, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of works now that use like contrastive learning to pull them closer together and so on, right? Right, um, right. It's, it, it's easier to, um, it's faster and e like easier to learn in the sense that like to actually implement it and learn it is, is easier. But I think to understand what has changed, one of the concerns I have there is just that one of the things I've been thinking about and working on is ways in which we can control um, the the actual transformation that we do. So rather than just letting it be kind of like a free for all, you can just take any gradient step that you want, update any parameter you want. Is there a way in which we can um, be more explicit about what parameters are allowed to be changed or how much they're allowed to be changed when you're adapting so that you can use these kind of techniques without as much fear of divergence? I see. Um, cool. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> 
Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I'd like to ask one question. Um, so what do you see are the maybe kind of main problems from your experience that are still remaining in terms of bias or evaluation or, or other potential pitfalls in terms of evaluation? I think from, from the data set creation standpoint where we've done a bit on this end, it seems like there's still a problem maybe with ambiguous labels um, where everything is just concretely one class label and there's no measure here for, for ambiguity. And maybe there's also something that can be done there um, that does not require manual annotation, but maybe there's also other <laughs> problems that are more important. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, it's not something that I've explicitly looked at, but I, I agree that in general, there's some sort of, um, there, there's a very particular way in which supervised learning happens today. And um, and this assumption that everything gets mapped to these, these, you know, the same exact label over and over again, maybe that's too, too limiting and can lead to um, some of these scenarios where we, where our models kind of learn to pick up on idiosyncrasies in the data set that we don't want them to. Um, so I think that's a interesting um, and important potential direction. Um, to the earlier part of your question, I think that in terms of understanding the biases in um, our data, especially as they relate to subpopulations, I think one of the biggest issues I see there um, that I've been looking into at least is um, this manual, this like assumed manual annotation step. Um, and maybe this is what you were getting at as well, uh, which is it's, it's really cumbersome to design um, a study into bias by basically creating another benchmark, um, creating or deciding amongst ourselves what are the, the factors that we need to be unbiased against and just doing more measurements along those. I think it, that creates a whole other set of issues in terms of whether or not that, uh, you know, whether or not the bias that exists in the data set is actually um, exactly due to that bias, exactly due to uh, that difference in that subpopulation, or if it's due to some other correlated um, thing in the data set. And, and if we can't understand that clearly, then how can we collect more data that doesn't also include that, that correlating factor? Um, and so I think there's space in here for doing some more unsupervised learning, unsupervised discovery of bias. Well, thanks. Any, any other questions? Um, I have a question regarding this uh, DOMA, uh, the DOMA adaption. So basically, um, what, what do you think the possibility that you transfer the feature from, I mean, one data set, set that's so different from another data set. Let's say if you want to transfer some indoor data feature, uh, like the feature you learn from indoor data set to an outdoor data set, do, do you think it's possible? Because you may learn some low level features that are in common, but finally the class did, you know, it's so different. The car and the table are so different, high levelly. So, uh, how how do you think the chance of this kind of transfer? Yeah, um, and that's a complicated question. Uh, so, when you're trying to change tasks as well, I didn't address that at all um, in today's talk. But when you're trying to change tasks as well, there's presumably some some amount of information that needs to be learned from scratch. Like you may not be able to um, reuse everything. Uh, but ideally you'd like to reuse as much as possible. And so being able to automatically find what, how much of a model is reusable and to decide, like, let's say you had a few different indoor models mm -hmm. and um, you wanna know which one of these will best transfer to my new setting of this outdoor world. Uh, even that is, is kind of a, a question that people have looked at, but I don't think there's a definitive answer yet of how to, how to solve that task. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Um, I might have another like hello question. So what do you think about the whole like sim to real developments, right? There's obviously a lot of stuff in robotics going on. Um, mm -hmm. 
do you think, I guess, first thing, is it just quote unquote just domain adaptation or I'm missing something high level there? And what do you think, what, what's the limitation? So we are very, like we're doing a lot of stuff on null rendering right now. And I mean, yeah. one of the reasons also why we looked at a lot of your work was because, well, we want to use it for ideally for some active learning in a sense of like, oh, we would love to generate data where we need to. And then, you know, we figure out these biases automatically. We know where the model needs more data and we can simulate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it seems pretty difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? Like, what's the limitation? Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, I mean, I, I think you're asking about a few different things at once. Um, yeah, yeah. One of them is just sim to real, which is like its whole own study. And the other one was um, like active acquisition or active generation, um, which active is something. Yeah, whatever you call it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, I think both are really interesting and important. And obviously, you have to solve them both to fully solve this this kind of sim to real problem. Um, so for the first one, the sim to real, if you're in the situation where you can create a simulator that you know closely mimics. Uh, the sort of real world scenario, it obviously won't be able to capture everything and it won't be as, like photorealistic enough necessarily to work out of the box, but that's where the adaptation techniques should be really helpful um, because they can handle some of those like changes that are potentially consistent across camera imaging statistics and um, generated imaging statistics. Um, where when you're talking about where are you still failing and what do you need to, um, you know, what do you need to generate more of? Um, that's, that's getting more into this analysis part. And um, first things, there, there's a few different strategies I could imagine, but the first thing would just be to even be able to, to know what type of, of data you're missing or um, where your model is performing really poorly. And, uh, you know, the standard thing that people look at is, of course, category analysis. But I think that that's, overly limiting um, and that's that's where you wanna you want to think more about how can we start to segment our data further and start to analyze performance and subsets of the data and can we use that to discover automatically you know parts of uh, and behavior of failure of the model yeah that's a good point actually I mean the third last thing is obviously only very limiting like the, that's just not enough in the moment. Okay, Any, anybody else has a, has a last question? I think we're running a little bit over time already. Okay, if there's no other question, um, thanks a lot. It was, it was really fantastic um, to listen to all the cool work and also the discussions. Um, I'm gonna see everybody else on YouTube and so on probably after Easter. And Judy, if you still have a bit of time, I'm not sure if Dian mentioned it, um, we still have a bit of an internal discussion to be with the students.